shall go all of my troubles when I get home. Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by T.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson. Brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich. Online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Nation Within a Nation, Martin Delaney. A commonly heard lament these days is that people have ever shorter attention spans. Thanks to a combination of social media, sound bites, and speed of access to information and services, we've reached the stage where we have a standard abbreviation for the expression, too long, didn't read. Such complaints inevitably make one sound like an old fogey, but perhaps there is something to this one when you consider the length of public speeches that were more or less cheerfully endured by 19th century Americans. Admittedly, the most famous of these, the Gettysburg Address, was a tidy 272 words long, though the audience had to be patient to hear Lincoln give it. The previous speaker took about two hours to get through his own speech, and that was not a prodigiously long performance by the standards of the time, as we can see from the record of Martin Delaney. Like his colleague and sometime adversary Frederick Douglass, Delaney was an accomplished orator. In Cleveland, in August 1854, he put his skills to work in a nearly four-hour speech called Political Destiny of the Colored Race on the American Continent. In the same year, it's claimed that his address as chairman of business committee for the National Emigration Convention clocked in at a scarcely credible seven hours. His theme in both speeches was the need for free black Americans to abandon the country. They should leave behind the unremitting repression of the United States for a better future. At this time, he argued for remaining on the same side of the Atlantic, in the Caribbean or in Central or South America, with Cuba striking him as an especially attractive option. He was dismissive of Liberia, the colony created in Africa by the American Colonization Society, through a scheme he called degrading, insolent, and slaveholding. Later, though, he would involve himself in other schemes for colonizing Africa, at one point even accepting financial support from the ACS. Delaney himself made his way to Africa in 1859, traveling in Liberia before moving on to Lagos and sizing up the prospects for a settlement in Yoruba land. Here he was impressed by some of the same cultural features we discussed in our episodes on pre-colonial Africa, such as an apparent commitment to monotheism and indigenous political organization. But he returned to the U.S. in 1860, visiting the United Kingdom en route, where he caused a sensation when appearing at the International Statistical Congress in London. There, he had the pleasure of publicly stating, to no less a personage than Prince Albert, I assure your royal highness that I am a man. It is especially, but not only, on the basis of this active emigrationist phase of Delaney's career that he's hailed, or blamed, as a father of black nationalism in the United States. He had an abiding pessimism about the situation of American blacks, still involving himself in emigrationist projects in 1878, after the Civil War and the abolition of slavery. But more than that, he voiced pride in his African heritage, glorying in his pure blood and dark complexion, and arguing repeatedly that black people needed to form their own communities and govern themselves. Africa for the African race, he implored, and black men to rule them. And you can probably guess who Delaney judged to be the most African of all the black men in the United States, himself. In public, he sometimes wore a dashiki, a very uncommon move for a 19th century figure born in the diaspora, and sometimes he wore what he claimed to be the wedding dress of an African chief. In a document reporting on his tour of Africa, he stated, I have outgrown long since the boundaries of North America. Delaney seems to have been many decades ahead of his time, the pan-Africanist leader-in-waiting of a separate black nation. This is the Delaney that people love to contrast to the aforementioned Frederick Douglass. The two were both newspaper men as well as public speakers. Delaney put out a paper called The Mystery for several years before joining Douglass in 1847 to help put out a paper with a larger circulation, The North Star. But the two would clash in the coming years. According to an early biography written about Delaney, Douglas supposedly commented, I thank God for making me a man simply, but Delaney always thanks him for making him a black man. The two clashed over the famous book by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, 
While Douglas welcomed Stowe's support of the abolitionist cause, Delaney wondered why slavery needed to be described in critique by a white woman who knows nothing about us as neither does any other white person. Though he thereafter allowed that this was just ironic exaggeration, he stood by his criticisms of Stowe, especially over her low opinion of Haiti. At a more abstract level, it can be argued that Douglas focused more on encouraging individual reliance, while Delaney's stress was more on solidarity and political autonomy for African American and African people. In this respect, it's telling that Douglas's chief writings were autobiographies, whereas Delaney's were mostly analytical texts on such topics as the origins of race, economic theory, and the political situation in various regions of the United States. Yet his most famous phrase already hints at the deeper ambiguities and complexities of his thought. In the most famous of those analytical treatises, The Condition, Elevation, Emigration, and Destiny of the Colored People of the United States, published in 1852, he observed that world history is full of oppressed classes, each of them a nation within a nation. The Israelites in Egypt, the gladiators in Rome, the Welsh and Irish in Britain, all of them suffered from deprivation of political equality. Echoing David Walker's claim about unsurpassed wretchedness in his appeal, Delaney concluded that the most unfavorable condition of all these disadvantaged classes was that of the colored people of the United States. This makes clear the reasons for his support of emigration, and calling the black population a nation emphasizes its potential, even its need, for separate governance and perhaps a land of its own. But if black Americans also find themselves within a nation to begin with, is it not possible that the most suitable outcome of political struggle would be their accommodation and integration within that larger nation? And this brings us to the other side of Delaney's thought. From early on, he was a zealous advocate of advancement for black Americans within American society. Delaney was born in Charleston, Virginia, but his family moved to Pennsylvania when he was still a child, and his intellectual formation took place in Pittsburgh. Here he studied medicine. In fact, the newspaper he later founded had the additional function of advertising his services as a doctor, and he came under the influence of his teacher, the Reverend Lewis Woodson. Woodson and another mentor, William Whipper, were optimists when it came to the plight of black people in America. Calling to mind the moralizing approach of Maria Stewart, rather than the militancy of David Walker, Woodson and Whipper believed in moral suasion through self-improvement. If African Americans could display industriousness and virtue, then racism would gradually recede. Throughout his career, Delaney laid particular stress on one aspect of this approach, economic uplift. As he put it, give us wealth and we can obtain all the rest. Of course, like most people of the time, Delaney was a Christian, and he saw human history in biblical terms, as we'll be seeing, but he had little faith in religion as an engine of equality, especially if religious formation was not joined to more practical concerns like vocational training. In fact, Delaney often lamented that Christianity was used as a tool for keeping slaves docile and persuading even free blacks to endure patiently the injustices meted out to them by the white majority. Our masters, he wrote, have been so accustomed to teach us how to live in the world to come that they've forgotten to teach us how to live in this world, but are always very careful to teach their own children and themselves, however religious they may be, how to make a living here while in this world. The slavers exercised earthly oppression and needed to be fought with earthly, not heavenly, resistance. Even political liberty would not be enough without increased prosperity, as Delaney wrote in the North Star, when encouraging the learning of practical trades. For this reason, he was scornful of idealists who sought to give African Americans a classical education. For them to learn Latin or Greek, as if the goal was to turn black people into scholars and professors, was a matter of taking a leap from the deepest abyss to the highest summit, rising from the ridiculous to the sublime without a medium. He was also strongly in favor of educating girls, though the rationale he emphasized which was also articulated by women's thinkers like Stewart before him and Anna Julia Cooper after him, was the questionably feminist point that educated women will make better homes. Our females must be qualified because they are to be the mothers of our children. Raise the mothers above the level of degradation and the offspring is elevated with them. 
he duly lavished praise on earlier luminaries like Benjamin Banneker, whom he calls a scientist and philosopher, as well as Phyllis Wheatley and Paul Cuffey. Such figures showed the great potential that could be realized by African Americans. Looking further back, Delaney trumpeted the achievements of ancient Africans, especially in Egypt. He praised the early emergence of monotheism there, a point we had occasion to discuss in episode 4 when we talked about Akhenaten, and he even suggested that Egyptian religious thought anticipated the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Some of these remarks were made in a context that will be familiar to us, the Masonic movement. Delaney was elected master of a lodge in Pittsburgh in 1852 and was the first to write a history of Prince Hall masonry. He joined the line of authors who pointed to the African origins of this tradition, asking, from whence sprung masonry but from Ethiopia, Egypt, and Assyria, all settled and peopled by the children of Ham? As we've seen in previous episodes, the history of black masonry was marked by the same tensions on display in Delaney's career. In theory, these organizations should have helped African Americans to establish themselves amongst their white neighbors. Here was a chance to join a club that counted even George Washington among its members. But in practice, the white Freemasons tried to exclude them. Perhaps you recall Prince Hall's struggle to get official recognition for his lodge in the 1780s. Well, in 1853, Delaney was still having to insist that our rights are equal to those of other American Masons, if not better than some, and it comes not with the best grace for them to deny us. Such rejections were, of course, a small-scale reflection of what was happening in wider American society. The 1850s were, in fact, a time of great disappointment for activists like Delaney. The decade began with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850, which made it possible to catch escaped slaves, or supposedly escaped slaves, in the North and bring them back to the slave states. As Delaney and others pointed out, this meant that even free blacks were permanently in danger of being seized wherever they lived. They were, as Delaney put it, slaves in the midst of freedom, waiting patiently and unconcernedly, indifferently and stupidly, for masters to come and lay claim to us. Then in 1857 came the infamous Dred Scott case, in which the Supreme Court ruled that black people had no right to citizenship. Along these political setbacks came personal ones. Precisely on the grounds that he was not a citizen, Delaney saw an application for a patent turned down in 1852. His idea had to do with transporting locomotives across the Allegheny Mountains. One year earlier, he'd been dismissed from Harvard Medical School, along with two other black students, after protests from white students over their admission. It's no wonder that Delaney was led to pose the question, shall we fly or shall we resist? and think that the right answer was to fly, away from the United States, to a better life elsewhere, in America or in Africa. He moved to Canada in 1856, to the town of Chatton, in what is now Ontario, to be specific, and by the end of the decade was exploring the west coast of Africa and planning settlements. And yet, later in life, we find him running for statewide political office in South Carolina, and serving as a judge in Charleston. When he died in 1885, it was in Ohio, not Cuba, Canada, or Yoruba land. One way to explain his shifting political and personal goals, and also the central tension between separation and integration that seems to run through his works, is an appeal to chronology. A book on Delaney by the Nigerian scholar Tunde Adeleke argues that the standard view of Delaney as a pioneering black nationalist and pan-African depends mostly on his writings and activities from a relatively brief part of his career, spanning from the early 1850s to 1862. This phase culminated with Delaney's novel, Blake, or The Huts of America, which appeared serialized in newspapers from 1859 to 62 and remained unfinished. A kind of militant answer to Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel and the Dred Scott decision, it tells the story of an escaped slave who aims to foment an uprising in Mississippi and then goes on to plan a further uprising in Cuba. This novel gives us a portrait of Delaney's ideals around 1860. In many respects, it is consistent with themes he had been sounding his whole life, for instance, the inefficacy of religion alone as a means of fighting injustice. At one point, the lead character is told to stand still and wait for salvation, to which he responds, I've been standing still long enough, and admits, I have altogether lost my faith in the religion of my oppressors. 
Of course, the selection of Cuba for Blake's revolt also fits with Delaney's emigrationist proposals. At a more abstract level, the novel articulates the value of solidarity and self-reliance. One of Blake's co-conspirators observes that people never entertain proper opinions of themselves until they begin to act for themselves. Delaney also follows Walker in arguing that black resistance requires disciplined secrecy. The point is dramatized when Blake inspires revolt by whispering a message in slaves' ears, which is never divulged to the reader. Secrecy stands for solidarity, which can strike fear into the hearts of the white masters who are motivated solely by greed. That point, too, is made dramatically, this time through the portrayal of a cynical slave owner who admits, I would just as readily hold a white as a black in slavery were it the custom and policy of the country to do so. It's all a matter of self-interest with me. Again, this is a case Delaney has made elsewhere in non-fictional settings, as when he observed that white Americans started by oppressing Native Americans before finding it more expedient to victimize Africans. It's always in the interest of a ruling class to have a dominated class who are as weak as possible, and racism is merely a retrospective justification. Then, with the Emancipation Proclamation, issued on January 1st, 1863, everything changed. Having so recently turned his back on his country, Delaney now literally fought to preserve it, joining the Union Army and receiving the rank of Major. He also petitioned Lincoln to create an all-black force to fight in the Civil War. Once the war was won, he was full of ideas for improving the lot of the freed slaves. Characteristically, these proposals focused on economic uplift. He pointed out the large potential market constituted by black people and envisioned a triple alliance between black labor, southern land, and northern capital. As Reconstruction wore on, Delaney was not just integrationist, but downright conservative, at least in comparison to more radical voices who insisted on quick and dramatic reform. He was worried that these radicals, who formed a faction of the Republican Party, would sow racial discord with their demands. As he memorably put it, we must not, in finding room for ourselves, undertake to elbow the white people out of their own places. This led to further tensions with Douglas, who said that if anyone other than Delaney was making these arguments, he would suppose him to be an ally of the old planters. In 1868, Delaney went so far as to argue against insisting that black politicians needed to be put in office. But then in 1871, we find him writing in a letter to Douglas, colored people must have intelligent leaders of their own race, and white people, intelligent leaders of theirs. Adeleke is surely right to point out that Delaney's views changed along with the political situation in the U.S. But as this last example shows, the tension between integrationism and nationalism seems to run throughout his whole career, including the final period during Reconstruction. One late work that fits with his reputation as a black nationalist is Principia of Ethnology, The Origins of Races and Color. He here argues that there are three pure races, descended from the sons of Noah. As we already saw him saying, black people are the sons of Ham. They should take pride in their color, given the stunning achievements of their forebears. As in his address to the Masons, he refers to the Ethiopians and Egyptians as the first to be advanced in morals, religion, arts, science, and literature. His extreme investment in racial difference is underscored by his perplexing notion that the mixing of races is, in the longer term, impossible. After a few generations, pure blood and pure white, black, or yellow skin will re-emerge, so that eventually the three original sterling races will make up the entire population of the world. This sort of material was evidently designed to justify and encourage an embrace of black identity and even black nationhood. One way to reconcile that with his more conservative political statements and actions is to say that Delaney's nationalism was pragmatic in nature. This is the line taken by Tommy Shelby, who argues in his important book, We Who Are Dark, The Philosophical Foundations of Black Solidarity, that Delaney vacillated between, and perhaps even confused, two conceptions of black nationalism, one in which separate nationhood would be an end in itself, another in which it is just an instrumental means to achieving a better lot for people of African heritage. It would make sense to shift from endorsing emigration to encouraging political integration if facts on the ground made it more reasonable to suppose that African Americans had a chance to achieve equality or even just work towards it. 
whereas the Fugitive Slave Law and Dred Scott seem to make this impossible, the Emancipation Proclamation and opportunities afforded by Reconstruction put it back on the table. Yet Shelby's interpretation has been forcefully rejected by another Tommy, Tommy Curry, who defends the traditional assessment of Delaney as a black nationalist, or as he prefers to say, nationist, meaning that he champions racial solidarity and embraces a distinctive culture not shared by white Europeans and Americans. No less than Shelby, Curry is able to cite strong evidence, not least the race theory of Delaney's Principia, which is indeed difficult to read the way Shelby needs to, as the work of a man who was, at most, half-hearted in his commitment to black separatism. Nor was this a commitment he developed late in life. Earlier in his career, Delaney had written that, the elevation of the colored man can only be completed by the elevation of the pure descendants of Africa. Without pretending we can resolve this dispute in the last couple of minutes left in this podcast, we would like to propose a different way of finding consistency across Delaney's works and throughout his evolving political thought. He clearly had different views at different times about the best way to attain political self-determination for African Americans, but he remained consistent in his philosophical view about why self-determination is important in the first place. He names, as a great principle of political economy, that no people can be free who themselves do not constitute an essential part of the ruling element of the country in which they live. Or, as he says elsewhere, a people, to be free, must be their own rulers. Each individual must in himself be an essential element of the sovereign power, which composes the true basis of his liberty. Mere suffrage, the right to vote, is not enough. The nation within the nation, that is Black America, must have its political fortunes in its own hands, which Delaney calls enfranchisement. Without this, not even personal safety is assured, never mind a chance at prosperity, as was vividly shown by the case of the Fugitive Slave Law. Whatever caution or prudence might dictate, this is the ultimate goal that must be pursued. As Delaney puts it in a passage that maintains an exquisite balance between nationalism and integrationism, I am not in favor of caste, nor a separation of the brotherhood of mankind, and would as willingly live among white men as black if I had an equal possession and enjoyment of privileges, but shall never be reconciled to live among them subservient to their will, existing by mere sufferance, as we the colored people do in this country. With these two sides of his thought, Delaney anticipates later figures whose names are more famous today. His pragmatism and emphasis on practical skills make him a forerunner of Booker T. Washington, his nationalist, emigrationist, and pan-Africanist tendencies a forerunner of Marcus Garvey. We'll be getting to them in due course, but we have next an equally famous name on the agenda, which is quite frankly also one of the coolest names in American history, Sojourner Truth. Martin Delaney often waxed enthusiastic about an ideal of manliness, by which he meant self-reliance and independence of mind, but she will remind us that to be manly in this sense, you certainly don't need to be a man. So join us next time to hear the truth, the whole truth, and also someone other than truth, as we look at her and another woman thinker who combined a focus on abolishing slavery with the attainments of women's rights, here on The History of African Philosophy. I'm gonna tell God.